Revelation chapter 5 gives us a vision of heaven. This is written by one of, uh, gosh dang it, oh, man, first service got me and now this one's getting me. All right, so this is written by one of uh, Jesus' best friends, John. And he sees his friend Jesus, not just as he was in the flesh, but he sees a whole nother picture of Jesus when he gets his vision of heaven. And this is what happens in Revelation chapter 5. It says, and they sang a new song, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. And they said with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing says to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. When we sing something like, we crown you king of glory, that is us saying, we are not the ones to wear the crown. We are not at the center of this universe. We're saying we crown you Worthy is the lamb who was slain. That is King Jesus who walked perfectly in our place, gave up his life on a cross so that you and I might be reconciled, pulled back into relationship with God. And then he was raised to life on the third day that you and I might spend eternity with him, not because of a darn thing you or I have done. We know we stand condemned If not for Christ, I don't even have, you don't even need the Bible to tell you that things are crooked up here. You don't need the Bible to tell you things are a little off. You can't even keep up with your own standard. I can't keep up with mine, much less a holy God. This worthy one who gave his life, that's the one we sing to. That's the one we lift up. We say in the South, if that doesn't light your fire, then your wood's wet. That's on you. But for those of us who are in Christ, and I know not everybody here, I know not everybody watching is a believer in Jesus. I get that. I understand that. We're so glad that you're here. We love the mess out of you. I hope you feel loved and encouraged today. But listen, I'm talking to you, believer. I'm talking to you who trusts in Jesus. When we sing something like that and join with all of creation singing, worthy is the lamb, That has to stir something up in here. If it does not, something is off. As we lay our lives low and we say, we crown you king of glory. And this is the assumption, right? We sing to Jesus and declare him as on the throne. But here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to take away. We don't just come in this place to sing, but we believe that that worthy one who sits on the throne actually gave us his word. And I want to make the case that if, th- like, if there is a cosmic creator who stands outside of space and time, who spoke everything into existence, if he has chosen to give us his word, I think this should take some priority in our life, yes or no? If this is the word of God, it's got to demand everything that we have. And as a church, we've been in Romans chapter 8 for a while. You can't not like Romans chapter 8. You can't. John Piper calls it the greatest chapter in the Bible. I didn't even know you could say that. You know what I'm saying? Some people are like, well, the word's in red. I I was told it was all God's word. I didn't know we had favorites in here. But in in Romans chapter 8, you can't not like it. Why? Because he starts it off by saying, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you know things are a little off here, a lot off here. You know what you have done, and you know the lengths that Jesus went through to save your wretched and my wretched soul. And it's a freeing, incredible, insane reality that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. I deserve to be condemned. As one of your pastors, I deserve to be condemned if not for Christ. But I now get to stand with his resume 
because of what he's done. Paul lays that out for us. And the second thing he says is, hey, bonus, there's no condemnation. But also Paul says, the spirit of the living God now dwells in you. Y'all are so quiet. Are you hearing me? Like, if you don't believe it, that's fine. Like, don't, like, don't fake it till you make it. But the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you, believer. Like, that, that was a pretty powerful act. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody be raised back to life by their own power and accord. But that same power lives in you. Not in some figurative metaphysical sense, like it's just out there somewhere. Like it literally, God's spirit literally dwells with and in his people to empower us to live this life of godliness. Paul's writing this to believers. And then he gets to today's text. And I'm gonna be honest with you. Today's text is heavy because it talks about putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Like, I wrestled with it all week because I'm like, how do I bring, like, a fun intro and lighten the mood? I mean, it just is what it is. We got to let the God, like, if there is one who is worthy and he's given us his word, we're just going to let his word speak. There's no condemnation. The spirit of the living God dwells in you. And then Paul picks up in verse 12. Here we go. He says, so then, brothers... Ladies, don't be bummed. It's brothers and sisters. Just blame the translators. We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will what? Live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. I just read that whole thing and the only word some of you remember is suffer. We'll get there. It's okay. But here's what Paul's doing. Paul is doubling down on this concept that he's been teaching over the course of this entire book, but specifically what we see here in chapter eight, that there's two forces at play. There's the flesh and there's the spirit. One brings death, one brings life. And he's saying, hey, you have a choice. Do you want life or do you want death? Is that there's, there's like not a middle ground here. Do you want to live by the flesh or do you want to live by the spirit? So we see that here and we go, well, thanks so much. I don't know what Paul means by flesh. Anybody else? You're like, how can this stuff that wraps me, how can my skin be like, I don't understand. This is what Paul means. Matt sent me this uh, quote from a book that he read. I thought it was so good. When Paul's talking about the flesh, he's talking about king self. Hear me. The greatest problem by far that any of us faces is the problem of self. King self is the chief hindrance to being filled with the Holy Spirit. What is self? It is the rebellious nature of every human, passed down from Adam, which seeks its own way, its own pleasure, comfort, and viewpoint with little or no regard for others. This is what Paul's talking about by the flesh. It's when we seek to make ourselves king. We choose our way over God's way. And we say, okay, Paul, like that makes sense. I get it. You know, flesh, spirit, death, life, like we want to walk by the spirit, but why are you reminding us again? You've already said it. Here's why I think Paul's reminding us again, because he knows that the furthest distance to travel is from head to heart. So many of us know this, but we don't let it sink into our heart and our soul. What do I mean by that? We know we've been forgiven of sin, but we don't know what to do with the daily struggle we still have with sin. We feel shame, but we're not supposed, we're not supposed to be, feel condemned. We're supposed to feel guilt, and we don't know what to, like, we feel like we're in these cycles. We don't know what to do 
with the daily battle with flesh. Paul gets it. Paul says in another, he says, wretched man that I am. Paul knows the believer's struggle with sin, the believer's struggle with the flesh. But hear me out. Paul also knows that we struggle with something else. We struggle with viewing sin the way that God views sin. I don't have to know you to know that's true. We struggle to deal with sin, to see the sin in our lives in the way that God does. The Bible says on account of sin, the wrath of God is coming. Thank God for Jesus. On account of sin, the wrath of God is coming. We read this and we think, that seems extreme. He's saying, but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, that's, that's heavy. That seems like a lot, Paul, but here's the thing. Paul knows we struggle to see sin the way God sees sin. He also knows that we struggle with apathy toward our sin. Some of us see things in our life that are, that are opposite of what God wants. They are sinful in our life. And what do we do? We keep them on a leash. We make friends with them. Not like sleep in the same bedroom friends, but like you could stay in a guest house. Some of us don't do the things required to see those sins in us end. We just kind of keep them around and we use phrases like, well, I'll do better next time. We use phrases like, you know, I'm just in a bad season. That's a word a bunch of Christians use, right? Like, just in a season. It's like, well, it's been four years. So (laughs) it's not really a season. It's kind of your life. Or we say things like, you know, like I'm better than so-and-so or... You know what I'm saying? We have like it's just a, it's just a bad habit. We say things like, I mean, you know, like I mean, it's, addiction runs in my family, so like you know, I kind of got like a pass. We don't deal with sin in the way that the Bible challenges us to deal with sin. He says, by the Spirit, put it to death. Here's the point: God's word isn't asking us to think about it, consider it, have a meeting with a pastor. Like, oh, I need to like talk to my therapist and see. No, no, no. The Bible is saying when you notice something that is counter God's way in you, when you see sin, it ought to die. Are you with me? Like, this is not like, this is so strong, this language, that we must put it to death. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to put this on ice for just a second, this idea of put it to death. Well, I'll just relieve the tension for a second. Let's put it right here. And then I want to walk over to this side and I want to go through verse 14 to 17. Why? Because I think we need to understand why we would even want to do this. Because I can say all day long, put to death the deeds of the flesh. Let the the work of the spirit in you is to put to death those deeds. That's like, why? Why would I do that? And Paul gives us that answer in 14 through 17. Look what he says. He says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And listen to verse 17. And if children, then what? Heirs. An inheritance is coming. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also might be glorified with him. Here's what Paul's doing. Paul is talking to a Roman culture that understands adoption this way. Are you ready? He understands that when you leave your former family in adoption in a legal sense in Rome, when you left your former family, you lost all status all inheritance, everything that was coming to you, everything you had earned in that family, you left it all. And when you were adopted by your new family, you received all the inheritance, you received all the status of that family as though you were born by blood into that family. Listen to this. Paul is saying that we believers, those of us who are in Christ Jesus, We have been adopted by God. We've left all that junk behind. And what we have received is that now we get to call Jesus, listen, 
not just king of glory, but our brother. He has shared with us the inheritance that was coming to him. Perfection, righteousness, right standing with God, holiness, his resume, eternity with the Father. He is sharing that with us. It says, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross so that we could what? Be adopted into God's family for those of us who believe. Believers in the room, when you wake up every single day, do you wake up with that reality? You want your day to go a little better? How about every day you start with the understanding that your identity is not whatever label the world wants to put on you. Your identity is deeply rooted in being a son or daughter of the most high God, not because of anything you've done to earn it, but because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. What an insane reality this is. What a wild world. God has created by his salvation that we get to wake up every day and root ourselves in the beautiful, rich soil of salvation. Amen. The world wants to label us by everything else. How the enemy divides us. We talked about this when we went through the book of Daniel. We just came out of an election. People want to divide us by political party. They want to divide us by the color of our skin. They want to divide us by our economic standing. They want to divide us by the country that we grew up in. For those of us who are in Christ, our chief identity is none of those things. Our chief identity is in the fact that we belong to God. What's so infuriating is the enemy hates this so much that the world just keeps trying to stick 30,000 labels on us. What God's word said is take those labels off and see that our identity is made new and beautiful in Jesus Christ because we are children of the king. And when you're having a bad day and when you're having a good day and when you're going through a great time and when you're going through a hard time, it is time to root yourself in the identity that comes with being an heir along with Christ to all that is coming through God. What an insane world. So we look at this and Paul does Paul things. He gives us all this amazing hope. And then he ends verse 17 like this. All of that is true. And he says, provided we what? Suffer. Told you we were coming back to it. Provided we suffer with him in order that we also would be glorified with him. And I want to be honest here. Some of us in this room, many of us in this room have suffered much. You could take suffering a ton of different ways, but what Romans 8 is pointing us to is the type of suffering that comes from self-denial. It's the suffering that comes from laying down king self and saying, we crown you king of glory, not me. We lay it down at your feet. Like it's that kind of self-denial where we say, I know this thing is in opposition to you, so I don't want it. I want what you want, Lord. That's the type of suffering. Because you know if you've done that, if you follow Jesus, that's hard work. Jesus says the road is narrow and few find it. The great news is that the work isn't on your shoulders. The work is on the spirit. We just got to show up. And I want to show you that by... by I, I was at war all week trying to understand. I don't know. Is anybody else confused by that? We read something that if he says, by, look, if you look at verse 13, halfway through, he says, but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Is that confusing to anybody else? It's like, wait, is it the spirit's work or my work? But if by the spirit you, when you assume he's just like, if by the spirit, then let him do the thing. But if by the spirit, then you, and I started thinking, man, what? How do we see that in the Bible, this co-work between the spirit and between us? You know a story I thought of? Anybody know the story of David and Goliath? If you show of hands, David and Goliath? All right. If you didn't raise your hand, nobody saw you, so you're all good. So I'm going to give you a really short version that you should go research on your own. But David was a young boy, probably between the age of 13 and 16. He became, God made him aware of something in his midst that stood in opposition to God. 
Are you hearing me? God made him aware of something in his midst that stood in opposition to God. And you know what David did? He didn't go meet with his therapist. He didn't go ask for a meeting with a pastor. He didn't sit and just pray more and harder. Lord, what should I do with this thing? What do you want me to do? No, no. He knew exactly what to do. He went as quickly as he could to the battle line. It says he ran to the battle line to do what? To kill the thing that stood in opposition to God. Here's what I want you to see. He's probably a 13-year-old kid. But God didn't raise David's arm, sling the sling around, and make him do Like, David did that. You see the work that David did there? David puts a stone in a sling. The Spirit's not, like, navigating his arm. He swings it, but the Spirit makes sure that that rock is right on line to knock that giant unconscious. And then the Spirit empowers him and says, go finish the job. This 13-year-old boy, like a legend, walks over in the power of the Spirit, stands next to this almost 10-foot giant, grabs his sword, not David's sword, the, the amount of savagery, grabs the sword of the person on the ground and cuts his head off, picks it up, and goes... Are you not entertained, right? Who's next? You think that's the strength and power of a 13-year-old boy? No, that's the strength and power of the spirit. But what did David do? David showed up. He let God show off. Do you see the difference? David showed up. He let God show off. That to me is the perfect picture of this spirit and us relationship when we look at something like this in Romans chapter eight, it's that, it's that desire. We gotta have that David-like desire to say, no, so God has made me aware of something that is in direct opposition to him. I'm gonna kill it, but by the power of the spirit. So we must show up and then let God show off. Do you see the difference? And here's what I know to be true. The reality of this teaching is that many of us in this room, we have things in our life that stand in opposition to God and they need to die today. The Bible is not asking you to consider it. Who, who in the world are we, believers in God? Who are we to hear a command from Scripture and say, let me think about it? Amen. Who the heck do I think I am? to come to the scripture with that kind of attitude. Some things need to die today. Here's a great quote uh, I read earlier this week. Are you ready? It said, for the life of every believer, we must be killing sin or sin will be killing us. We must be, this is the work called sanctification. It's a work of the spirit. That's the theological term. It's that purification of us. We are saved. We are in Christ. There is now no condemnation, but this daily battle with sin, the spirit is at work in us, but we've got to show up to the fight. We must be killing sin or sin will kill us. And let me be clear. I don't even need to build a case for this because you already know the damage that sin causes in your life and the life of those around you. Yes or no. You see the destruction, the wake of destruction behind your sin. When you lie to your spouse, tell me, how does that go? Does that bring life and unity and joy? No, it brings, some things have to die. It brings separation. When you cheat on someone, how does that go? Great, like, oh man, that we, look, I just brought us so much closer together. No, it brings so much terror along with it, not just for you, but by the people you included in your sin. When you speak ill of someone behind their back and they find out about it, how does that go? Great. Did that really build the relationship? No. Sin destroys. Sin tears down. Sin brings death. We must kill it by the power of the Spirit or it will kill us. I'm not saying that you're strong enough to do this on your own. Don't hear me preaching a works-based gospel. That is not what this is. But what I am saying is if you say you follow Jesus, but you're not following Jesus, I don't know what you mean. 
If you say you trust in God, but you're not in obedience to show up to the fight, to put sin to death, I, I, I don't know what you mean. God's provided everything we need to slay our sin. So how do we do it? I'm going to give you three things because I'm a pastor and that's what we do. We don't know how to count to four or two, just three. <laughs> so number one, what has God given us? God has given us his word. God has given us his word. Ephesians six seventeen says that the sword of the spirit, the weapon you show up to the fight with, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Now, why do I share that? Because I think too often we got too many believers that are biblically illiterate. We are word of God illiterate. If that is God, if there is a cosmic king who has given us his word, this demands everything that we have. We must read it. We must meditate on it. We must internalize it. We must dwell on it. We've got to memorize this stuff. We've got to know what the word of God is saying. Don't act like you love God if you don't love his word. Don't act like you follow Jesus if you don't do what he says. Also, how will we know the names and categories for our sin if not for the Bible? Did God leave us, leave us in mystery? No, he didn't. Praise God for his word. What do we see in Colossians 3, 5 through 10? You're going, well, listen, I know there's things off in me, but I don't, I don't have categories for that. I don't, have, I don't know what needs to die. Well, look, Paul will help you out. Colossians 3, starting in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Here we go. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetedness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you two once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Listen, another list. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Some of you were doing really good till that last one. He says, do not lie to one another seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. We have things in us that stand in direct opposition to God, the thing called sin. We must show up to the fight so that the spirit will kill and slay those things in us. For some of you, this means getting really comfortable with this word. Are you ready? No. No. Not let me think about it. Not maybe. Not let me see who it's going to harm before I do it. No. I called my buddy Cody, who's a pastor in Gloucester, who's had a history with addiction. And I was like, look, I don't want to just preach a message to people who are really chemically struggling with being dependent on something and just tell them to say no. He's like, that's exactly what we need to hear. He's like, you got to get to a point where you're at the end of it and you say, no, I can't do this anymore. No, the answer is no. Some of you got thoughts rummaging around in your brain. You've got to tell those thoughts, no. You've got to take them captive, which is the second thing. So number one, that is the word of God. Number two, God has told us in his word, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, he says, take every thought captive. And here, here is the part that everybody leaves off of this verse. Take every thought captive to what? To obey Christ. You don't just take it captive to be like, oh, that's cute. Look at that. Let's put it in a cage and see how it goes. No, we put that in submission to Jesus. Take every thought captive. Putting things to death can be as easy as showing up saying no, and then filtering through every thought thereafter. When you have a thought, here's why we have to hold it captive. I want to show you this. Because I, when you have something come in your mind, you and I know we're not mature enough to always know which ones are good and godly and which ones are evil and us. And so the reason we got to capture these thoughts is because we got to remove them just far enough to go, wait, what are you? Are you life to me or are you death to me? Are you God or are you the enemy? Are you good or are you evil? We got to hold those things. And what do we do? When we see that they're evil, what do we do? We let the spirit do 
what the Spirit does and slay it. We lay those thoughts at the feet of Jesus and he kills them. And then what do we do? We root ourselves in the word of God and we believe his truth over whatever lie that was. But when we have a thought, when we take a thought captive and we realize, wait, that thought's good. That thought's godly. What do we do? Put it right back in. See, I'm going to dwell on it. Paul says, dwell on things above. When you take a thought captive and you identify, ooh, that's a good one. That's a life one. Shove that thing back in there. Screw it tight. Whatever you got to do, dwell on that stuff, man. This is how we get out of our heads and begin to do the work of seeing the spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh in us. We've got to take every single thought captive. Number three, so we have God's word, take every thought captive to obey Christ. Number three, to put things to death. Some of us need to put extreme guardrails in our lives. Some of us have to put some insanely extreme guardrails. And hear me, some of you need to set up these guardrails to get out of the cycle of sin that you're in, but I know even thinking about that right now seems daunting to you. It seems so heavy to you. You're like, that's a lot of work to get started. I want to read you, I want to read you something from Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. In case you didn't get it, he goes on. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Do you see how seriously Jesus sees sin? He's not asking us to keep it as a pet. He's not asking us to do better, try harder. No, he's saying if there's something that is causing you to sin, cut it off. Now, let me be clear. Jesus is not advocating for self-mutilation, but he is advocating for desire and behavior mutilation. Those motives inside of us that lead us to try to be king self and put that crown back on our head, he says, no, 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 no. You've got to cut that stuff off. And the reason some of us got to put extreme guardrails is some of us have to be willing to do the work of showing up to the fight so that the, you can see the spirit show off in your life and free you. What do I mean by that? Some of you in this room, if you can't stop watching porn, you may need to be the one person in your sphere who does not have a phone. You say, well, that's insane. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away to make sure you couldn't even take it back to a surgeon. He's like, don't even take it out and just hold it so that you could see, oh crap, I didn't mean to do that. Can someone put that back in? No, throw it away. If you can't stop looking at porn or being tempted to lust, cancel your Netflix account. Get rid of a computer. You go, well, how would I do my work? I don't know, that's up to you. But we've got to start taking sin seriously like God takes sin seriously. He says we got to put to death the deeds of the flesh in us. Some of us can't stop judging people. Some of us need to be the only person we know that isn't on social media because we're just scrolling and all we're doing is judging and the people we're not judging, we're envying. And we're looking at the highlight reel of somebody else's life being like, I wish I was them. I wish I was going on those vacations. I wish I had a spouse like that. I wish I had a this. I wish I had a that. It's like, no, that stuff's not good. Get off it. I'm not saying social media is evil, but I'm saying if you can't handle it, if it's leading you to sin, Put it to death. Put an extreme guardrail in your life. Some of you can't stop gossiping about people. You cannot, say, you talk so crazy about people when they're not in the room. Hear me. Some of you, to fix that, need to tell every single person that you are in regular communication with, hi, my name is Travis. I gossip a lot. Do not let me talk about anyone that is not in this room. And if I do, Pick up the phone and call them. You say, well, that's crazy. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. You say, well, I couldn't do that. I can't put that on other people. Great, then take a vow of silence for six months. I don't know what to tell you. Some of us are struggling with unforgiveness in our heart. You've held onto it so long, you don't even know who you are without it. You hate it, and yet it's a comfort blanket at the same time. Some of you need to pick up the phone 
today and offer forgiveness to someone who has wronged you. Show them the grace of God. This is what the Bible says. After Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount gives this beautiful way that we ought to pray to God, he says, but listen, if we do not forgive others, our heavenly Father will not forgive us. Do you hear that? Believer in God, do you hear the seriousness that God takes forgiveness? He didn't even put it in a parable. It's like, it's a, that's a command. That's a statement. I can't even use like biblical semantics to make it say something else. It says what it says. Some of you, if I'm honest, you're workaholics. You barely see your family. You're obsessed with work. It's all that's on your mind. I just got to tell you, you use excuses like, why should I provide for my family? Man, I got to make a living. I got to make some. Listen, that's a sin. If your work is your idol, either A, get some discipline in your life to shut work off, or B, quit your job. You say, well, that's insane. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. You don't think about it. You don't talk to a bunch of people to figure out what are my cool next steps? What do people think? Some of us in this room, we're so self-righteous. We're listening to this being like, I ain't got nothing in my life that needs to die. I can't even remember the last time I sinned. Well, guess what? I know it needs to die in you. Right? Just maybe, just maybe start with like, Jesus is perfect, but you know, you aren't. And some of you listening, this is going to hit home. This is going to hit home. Some of you are in a pattern of anxiety. I'm going to tell you something that is so loving. This is a word from your pastor who loves you. Anxiety, constant anxiety is a sin. The Bible says, Jesus says it. Paul says it. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. Jesus says, do not be anxious. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Some of us have to start taking those anxious thoughts captive and saying, you are death to me. Spirit, slay it. And one's going to come three seconds behind it. You know what you do? You take that one captive and you say, spirit, slay it. And you start dwelling on the word of God that is the sword of the spirit. You start believing truth over lie to put that stuff to death. There's the last scripture I'm going to read to us to just drive home the point of how seriously God takes sin. It's in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Listen, he says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Listen to verse 26 again. For if we go on sinning deliberately, is the key word there, after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Listen to me. I am not preaching. You cannot out sin God's grace. That is not what this says. But what this is pointing to is if you say you follow Jesus, and you continue to deliberately find yourselves in patterns of sin with a lack of repentance, you're not saved. Just because you prayed a prayer and talked with a pastor, if there is no fruit in your life to say you follow Jesus, then you likely do not follow Jesus. I'm going to invite the prayer team up. This is how we're going to close out the service. Listen, some of us, we gotta, we've got to put some things to death today. I, this is, I'm not asking you to consider it. Don't go home and think about it. Don't weigh your options. There are things that need to die today. And for most of us, that begins with some level of confession, not just to God, but to someone else, to drag that stuff into the light. This is what I know to be true, right? I, I've been a pastor too long. Somebody in this room over the three services is likely having an affair. This is what I'm telling you. You have to take the word seriously. Today is the day it ends. Delete the number out of your phone, tell your spouse, and put it to death. There are things that need to die. There are things in our life that stand in opposition of God that need to be slayed by the power of the Spirit, but we've got to be willing to show up and fight. There's some of us in this room who think that no one sees. God sees. 
God sees, but God loves the mess out of you. He sees you in the midst of the affair, and he loves you. He's a good father who wants life for you and freedom for you. He's not, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but you got to get free by the power of the Spirit. We've got to put some stuff to death in us. I've had seasons of this in my life. I have to do this all the time. It's not one heroic act. It's a daily self-denial to say, God, it is your way, King Jesus, not my way. Some of you got to root your identity in the soil of salvation. Some of you got to know for the first time today that you are a sinner. A perfect God created you. You have sinned and that sin separates you from him, but he's not pissed at you off in a distance. He looks at you with love because he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the ultimate price for your sin so that you could be invited into relationship. You could be adopted as a son or daughter of God where there is now, therefore, no condemnation and you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Last thing. It's not enough to just clean house. You can't just slay things and not fill. Some of us got to be about the business of starving the flesh and feeding the spirit. The word of God, prayer, community, confession. Some of us need to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. Jesus didn't give up his life on a cross so we could walk around all bummed and like, oh, you know, I'm just a sinner. I'm not like, no, no, no. He died so that we could have life and life to the full. He's come that we could have freedom, but we got to walk in his way and trust him in it. So I'm going to pray for us. And then listen, if you want somebody to pray for you, if you want to confess to somebody, listen, there may be somebody in this room that you're holding bitterness against. Get up, go talk to them. There may be a text message you need to send, a phone call you need to step out and make. Do it. Put these things things to death today so that we could be glorified with him in eternity. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you. We lift you up. God, let us respond to your word as people who love you, not people who pretend like they love you, people that are submitted. Let us be a church that is submitted to you. We want what you want. That's it. Fill us with your spirit, Lord God. We Cast out all of the junk in us that does not honor you. Kill it, Lord, that we could live in the freedom that you provide. We love you. We honor you. Move in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.